Well, hello, this is Adam. Welcome to another Porch Chat here. We're talking about the best of worst of. And today we're going to talk about another worst of, and that is related to GM engines in this malaise era, kind of that late 70s, early 80s or so time frame. And a particular trait that some of them share, and that relates to mostly the Chevrolet small blocks and the Cadillac HT4100 engines, at least in my experience. It may well relate to others um, as well. But that is nothing other than soft camshafts. So unfortunately, a lot of these engines that were tried and true and reliable got saddled with camshafts that I believe weren't properly heat treated or for whatever reason, they just were not hardened appropriately. And again, a lot of times this happened on the small block Chevrolets, the 305s, the 350s, and the Cadillac HT 4100s. The 4100 had, I think, soft camshafts to begin with, and then it coupled, it was coupled with uh, typical intake gasket failures, which then leached coolant into the oil, which certainly didn't help <laughs> from a lubricating perspective and probably accelerated the wear. Um, and then, of course, the head gaskets also blew on that engine. Just really not a great design with the aluminum block, iron head, aluminum intake, with a lot of RTV and a lack of gasketing on the early ones. GM loved RTV and was trying to use it during that time. I don't know why, especially when you've got dissimilar metals expanding and contracting at dissimilar rates. And I didn't say that incorrectly. It is an aluminum block and an iron head and an aluminum intake. That's what it is. But here's my personal experience. First of all, I'll show you this camshaft. Hopefully the camera can pick this up. This is from a Pontiac 455 that I had some work done on. I had, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of engine work done way back in the day. And I put in a slightly hotter than normal camshaft into it. But you can see, if you've never seen a camshaft, this is what it looks like. And these are all the different lobes. There's 16 lobes for a two-valve V8 engine. You have two valves per cylinder, 16. So you can see there's four lobes here. And as I rotate it, notice that there is a point on, these are called lobes. And that's where it pushes on the lifter to activate a valve opening and closing. And you can see as I spin this, each of these uh, camshafts, or sorry, each of these lobes, has a nice point to it. You know, they're timed differently, obviously, because the cylinders fire at different points. They intake exhaust. <laughs> they don't intake exhaust. Well, they do intake exhaust gas through the EGR valve when it's open. But they intake uh, a uh, fuel and air charge. And then they also exhaust gas when the valves are open uh, because of this camshaft. So this is a Pontiac camshaft. And you can see down here, this is where the distributor gear goes. So the distributor interfaces with this gear, both helical gears, and this is basically what makes your distributor turn when your car's running. So that's what a camshaft looks like. It's pretty heavy, by the way. I would say maybe 15, 20 pounds, something like that. This is not light. This is a good one <coughs> where all the lobes do that. Now, I'll show you the camshaft. This is the camshaft out of my 85 Coupe de Ville that I had a number of years ago. And when I bought the car, it had 25,000 miles on it. I paid $800 for it. It didn't run quite right. The seller told me that. But I thought, well, the car is cosmetically excellent. It looks perfect. And, you know, first thing I'll do is I'll just try some typical diagnostics. I used to fix up 80s era GM cars all the time in college. That's what I cut my teeth on. And I made some spare money buying and selling them. And they often were finicky just because of the 80s era engine sensors. So I thought, well, maybe that's the problem with this one. And if it's not, I'll have to pay some money and get it fixed. But I'm not paying much for the car, so why not risk it? Got the car. And yeah, it didn't want, run quite right. So the first thing that I noticed was the idle speed was varying when it was in gear. And I had a hard time figuring out what in the world was going on. I did a full tune-up on it, and the idle speed was perfectly smooth if I unhooked the idle, uh, what do they call those, idle speed controller. Those have a little idle speed controller that moves the idle in and out as you turn the power steering to compensate for load or you engage the air conditioning. 
et cetera, et cetera. It's similar to the idle air control valves. It's just a different setup. It actually moves the throttle itself as opposed to opening air, allowing more air into the throttle body. So I, when I unhook that, it idles perfectly. No issues at all. So, huh, that's very strange. Um, so I replaced the idle speed uh, controller. That wasn't it. The new one did the same thing. Then I read a passage in the, the service manual that said if you're experiencing this issue, you may have a worn distributor gear. And that's causing the timing to jump around at idle. And when the timing jumps around, the computer gets confused and it does all sorts of things. That was the problem. And probably that was the first thing that should have popped into my mind on further issues is, huh, the distributor gear is worn at 25,000 miles. And I knew this car, when I got it and I opened the glove box, it had receipts for the guy, the previous owner, had the engine removed, had, it must have blown the head gaskets because he had the intake gasket, the head gasket, full tune-up, new crankshaft even, new water pump, new everything. And they put it back in the car and it still didn't run right. And I think he just had enough of, of the car. He couldn't figure out what was going on with it. So once I put in the new distributor gear, it idled fine. But it just didn't have any power. That was my other issue that I have. It was fine if you drove around town normally. Um, but if you stepped on it or you tried to accelerate with anything beyond a third throttle, it was just like it was restricted. It didn't have any issues. So I checked the fuel pressure. Fuel pressure was good. The spark was good. Um, you know, I couldn't find, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, and the other thing is I, I did uh, even like a compression test on it. I didn't have a compression tester at the time. I was just a poor college kid, but I unhooked the fuel pump fuse and I cranked it over. And you could hear each cylinder going rum, 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 rum. So it had, the rings were good and everything in it. That wasn't the problem. So I was a bit befuddled until I decided, well, the only thing that's left here is that maybe some of my valves aren't moving up and down like they should. So I took one of the rocker arm covers off, started the car, and sure enough, I saw a number, probably half of the valves were activating correctly, and some of them were moving about like this as the car was idling. I thought, uh-oh, well, that's probably a bad camshaft. And it was, with 25,000 miles on it. So I found that was too big of a job for me in a front wheel drive car. I found a guy who was a Cadillac mechanic who was doing moonlighting work who replaced it, the camshaft in it for me for $800, I think, at the time, which is a big, big job. And actually before that, I had driven the car maybe 15,000 miles with a flat camshaft. And like I said, it was fine. It just didn't have any power. Like getting on the freeway entrance ramp, it reminded me of being even worse than my 79 Seville diesel. It just... I would guess it probably had, a, the car only came with 125 horsepower. It might have had 75. I mean, it was never backfired, though. But it just didn't have any power. That was the reason why I didn't think it was a camshaft, because if I floored it, like I said, it didn't backfire at all through the intake or anything. I don't know why. But in any case, here is the camshaft from my 85 DeVille. And here it is. So this is from a 4.1. This is an HT4100 camshaft. And take a look as an example at this lobe versus this lobe. So as I spin this camshaft, you'll notice this lobe has a point, right? Where's the point on this lobe? <laughs> it's very blunt, very blunt to say the least. And then look at this lobe here as I rotate it. Where's the point? I mean, you can see it, but it's barely there. And a lot of these, you know, this, see the height on this point, on this lobe? Look at this and this lobe. I mean, that is a pretty, pretty rounded off lobe as well. And this one, watch this one here. Nothing. You should have seen the lifters. I saved the camshaft. I didn't save the lifters. But the lifters, I've never seen lifters like that. They had divots in them. So, um, yeah, soft camshafts. And again, this is a camshaft from a car with 25,000 miles on it. That's it. So beware when you buy some of these Malaysia vehicles. They, uh, you know, I would say the, the, this issue kind of occurred from the late 70s to early 80s, more or less, in, with some degree of frequency. Before that, 
then after that they seem to have fixed it. But uh, you know this Pontiac camshaft from a Pontiac that I had uh, years ago, I think this engine had maybe close to 100,000 miles on it or something. Camshaft's fine, no issues. Although Pontiacs did have that issue too. They did have um, some issues with that even before the late 70s. So thought I would just share and if you've never seen a camshaft, this one, by the way, the 4100 is much lighter than the 455 camshaft, not surprisingly. But something to be, be careful of when you're looking at cars. Make sure they run well, especially if you're buying a Malaysia or one. In any case, hope you enjoyed that porch chat. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care. Thanks again for watching this video, talking about some of the soft camshafts on various engines. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like and comment as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve it up to more viewers like you. And if you're not yet subscribed, please click the circular icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left and check out a few video thumbnails at the bottom left and right specifically selected for you. Thanks again. Until next time, take care.